Welcome to Mosaic, everybody. Glad that you're here. Hope you've had a great uh, second week of class. I wonder if it's going as quick for you as it's going for me. I'm looking at my calendar going, how many more weeks do we have a Mosaic? And it's, it seems to be going down really quick, even though it's only number two. Glad you're here to worship with us tonight. I, I missed my opportunity last week to introduce you to our band. Um, I think it's very important that you know the people who are leading you in worship. So if you haven't got to talk to any of us before, um, find us after church sometime, and we'd love to get to know you too. But uh, over here on stage right on electric guitar, this is Joey Cephalou. Haley Simpson is uh, my co-worship leader. Davis Drawn is playing another electric guitar. James Robertson on acoustic. Brian Maines on drums. And Scott Dawson is playing bass. Um, you may not remember all of our names, and that's totally okay. We want to get, you, get to know you on a personal level. And here's why. Worship in a corporate gathering like this is something that is personal and it's private in a certain way, but it's also something that we do to, together as a group. That's why we get together in the same room. That's why it was so painful back in March whenever we had to worship together, but apart at home, online. Uh, we do this because I've, I've told uh, a few of you, your worship encourages me. Even though I'm your worship leader, it's significant for me to see you participating in honoring and glorifying our good God together with me. And I think it's true for every single one of us up here. The way that you praise God in the middle of your circumstances is encouraging to those who are around you. So as we sing tonight, don't be afraid to sing out. We're, we've got our, our work cut out for us tonight. This is a big old room and we're uh, socially distanced. Some of you may be wearing masks even to kind of deflect some of the sound, but don't hold back on your singing. Make it loud. You never know how your outpouring of your heart to our great God may also encourage the heart of your neighbor on the pew right next to you or in front of you, maybe even behind you if you sing loud enough. So tonight we have a good reason to sing loudly. Our good God has died on the cross for us so that we no longer live in death and sin and darkness and this broken world, but we're called to life. So would you stand to your feet tonight and let's worship our Savior God with all that we got. Here we go.
break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen That's true. 
Y'all, that's a, a group of us went to Passion, and, and that's the band that, that sings that song. That's how we began this crazy, screwed up year. We, we were singing that there is a lion roaring. His name is Jesus, the King of Glory. So don't lose heart, oh my soul. There is hope. There is always hope. I can never be reminded of that enough. I want to read to you the words of Paul from his letter to the Colossians. He said this, I pray that you will learn to give thanks to the Father who has made you fit to share the inheritance of God's holy ones in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and transformed us into the kingdom of his beloved son, Jesus. He is the one in whom we have redemption. He is the one in whom we have the forgiveness of all our sins. For in him, all the fullness was glad to dwell and through him to reconcile everyone, all things to himself making peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, yes, things on the earth and also the things in the heavens are all reconciled unto himself. And then he asks this question to the Colossians. He says, so what about you? What will you do in response to what I just told you about the person, the character, the identity of Jesus Christ and all that he's done for you. I choose to trust him because I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, he's always going to get me to the other side. Would y'all learn this song with us tonight? I'm going to walk on the ocean floor.
does. Can we sing them together one more time? Remind your heart with this truth. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you you up tonight because of who you are because of what you've done and what you're doing in each one of our hearts our circumstances look different our days have looked different our, our weeks the last few months have looked different for every single one of us but we are the same in that each one of us need you desperately and not just once but every day all day long we need you at work in our hearts encouraging us to keep on going because you're going to bring us to the other side because you are the way maker. Teach us to never forget that. Speak to our hearts now in this moment as Evan brings your word. May we not walk out of this place the same way that we came in. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Hey guys, um, I want to give you a little bit of background. First of all, my name's Evan Henson. I work with college students here at First Lubbock. Um, my preferred way to teach on Thursday nights is through a book of the Bible uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, if I try to teach topically, uh, what tends to happen is I, I get on my soapbox and I teach things that affirm uh, what I already believe to be true. And I don't allow scripture to stretch me. And I just find texts that are easy to deal with. And so I, I tend to um, force my hand on that by working my way through a book. So two semesters, we did Amos. Last semester, we did Hebrews. Um, we got through about Hebrews chapter 6. And I thought about finishing that this semester. And I decided not to for those that weren't here so that you don't feel like you missed a bunch. But uh, we are going to be in Hebrews tonight. And so for these first three weeks, I'm going to go outside of my norm, and I'm not going to teach through a book of the Bible, uh, because I want to establish something uh, that we um, pride ourselves in, that we're proud of, and I, I think it's a, a good pride. Um, we're proud of the fact that as a college student at this church, you are not a member of First Lubbock College Ministry. You're a member of First Lubbock of this church, and, and this is an extension of this church, and, and this is a service that's aimed directly at your age, and, and we have other ministries that are aimed directly at your age, but by and large, you are a part of our larger body here at this church, and then uh, I hope you understand a, a larger body then uh, in the global church, but um, you're going to see if you uh, occupy uh, any part of this building you're going to see three words that we plaster on almost every wall and around every corner and on all of our t-shirts and on all of this and that. And you're going to see worship, transform, and serve. And so I decided that before we get to the verse by verse, which we are going to work our way through James uh, this semester, uh, these first three weeks, I want to talk about those words. And I want to frame it this way, that because of what God has done for us, we worship. And because of what God is doing in us, we are transformed. And because of what God is going to do through us, we serve. And so these first three weeks, we're going to um, be taking uh, pieces out of Scripture, which is a, a dangerous game to play, uh, where you pull pieces out of context. So I'm going to try to contextualize them as much as I can uh, within one sermon. Uh, but just know this is not the norm, but it is what we're going to do for these first three weeks. So if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 13, that's where we'll be. Um, Hebrews is an incredible book. I really enjoy it. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. We don't really know Hebrews, uh, who Hebrews is written to, but uh, we think it's probably written to uh, Jewish people who have converted to Christ, who are being persecuted by Jewish people who have not come to believe 
Christ to be the Savior. And so it's Jewish people that have left a a long storied tradition in their religion for this new guy on the scene, Jesus. And so to understand some of the the hard things that they would have experienced, uh, it's, it's hard to grasp because we don't have a long history. We don't really value history in the West. We don't value things that have aged. We discard them and get new things. And so the idea of having a 10,000 year history that has by and large been saying one central thing for 10,000 years, that there is going to be a Messiah. And when this Messiah comes, he is going to be a warrior. And this Messiah warrior is going to take over uh, from whatever group is in, in charge at that time. At this point, it's the Romans. And he's gonna take over the Romans and he's gonna bring the Jewish people back to the rightful power that they were meant to have all along. 10,000 years, generation after generation after generation after generation singing this same song. And then Jesus comes and he flips the whole thing on its head. So yeah, he, he comes and he looks over Jerusalem just like a conquering king would, but he doesn't gloat, he weeps. He enters on the back of an animal, animal but not a, a white stallion, not a, a big horse to show off his wealth, no, a, a donkey. It was traditional for a conquering king to go first to the most sacred place and Uh, make it profane. So when the Babylonians took over Jerusalem, they went straight to the temple and began to slaughter pigs all over the temple because of how profane that would be to Jewish people. Jesus goes straight to the temple, uh, straight to the sacred place, but he doesn't um, profane it. What he does instead is he cleanses it. Right? Jesus does all the steps but does them wrongly if you're waiting for a conquering king to come and overthrow this oppressive um, kingdom. And so for the Jewish people, they're going, okay, yeah, 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 we get it. But one, he claimed to be God, not what we're into. Two, he doesn't look anything like what we've been waiting so long for. And, And three, he says things all the time about giving up power. Right, they try to make him king and he disappears. He says uh, uh, that the meek will inherit the earth, not the powerful. He says, blessed are those who mourn, not blessed are those who conquer. And so this small group of Jewish people that came to know Christ as their savior are being persecuted by the Jewish people that think he was just a radical lunatic. And so this letter is written to assure Jewish Christians that you were correct and assuming that this is the Savior. And so if you read the first few chapters, you're going to see things like Jesus was the exact imprint of God. Right? He wasn't a copy. He was the exact imprint of God. He, he, he is very much so God. Then he's going to go into these better than a, a, a series. And they seem kind of weird to us because we've probably never assumed that angels were better than Jesus or that Moses is better than Jesus or that the law is better than Jesus, but Jewish people did. And so uh, the author goes through these, these lists of Jesus is better than the law. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the angels. And he's building all along for 12 chapters this case about the fact that Jesus is who Jesus said he was. And then we get to chapter 13, and it's these final admonitions to these people. We're going to start in verse 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is bought in the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go uh, go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. 
For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now he's going to begin talking about food, which feels weird. And uh, if we had read verse 8, it wouldn't make any more sense because he's talking about marriage before that. And, uh, but what seems to be happening is, again, they're caught up in the tradition that they came out of. And so there's this idea that what we put in our body is what makes God uh, pleased. Right, all the food laws. If you've read the, the first five chapters of the Bible, all sorts of food laws. And he's saying, no, 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 it's not what you put inside your body, right? Even, even the sacrifices, uh, the, even the good food, right? The stuff we've offered to God has to be taken outside the camp and, and taken care of. It's not about what goes inside your body. It's about what you return out of your body, uh, off of your lips to acknowledge the name of Jesus that matters. He says, we're about to, uh, uh, to have some persecution. And so we're going to exit the camp where Jesus was persecuted as well. And he, he's preparing them for this uh, persecution that they're going to endure. But then he comes right back to, but in the midst of that, there is only one response to the previous 12 chapters. If Jesus really is all these things that the author of Hebrews has said he is, right? If Jesus really is better than the angels and the law and the Moses, if Jesus really is the exact imprint of God, if Jesus really is God incarnate, if Jesus really did die for our sake, if he really did stay dead for three days and then really did raise from the dead, there is only one proper response. And that is the continual sacrifice of praise from the lips of those who claim him. I don't know if you've read Psalm 119 lately. Psalm 119 is, uh, could be described as a lot of things, but it's exhaustive. It'll probably take you, if you read out loud and you read Scripture really like it's intended to be read, uh, Scripture was never, uh, the original authors of Scripture never intended us to sit in our rooms and read it in the morning before we went to work. Uh, I think it's good that you engage with Scripture on your own. Uh, but the authors of Scripture intended for it to be read aloud to its audience. And so if you read Psalm 119 out loud, if you read this psalm of praise, it'd probably take you 15 minutes. It is exhaustive and the theme of all of this is how great the law is to David over and over how great are your law how great are your laws how great are your statutes how great are your precepts has all he must have had a, a pretty exhaustive thesaurus he uses all different words but they all mean the law and modern Christians read this now and go, oh, to have such a, a reverence for Scripture, I, I want to echo the words of David. Sure, you should love the Bible. David's not talking about our Bible. He's actually talking about the first five books of the Bible, and not even all of them, just the actual laws. David is enamored awestruck and excited to thank God for rules like, like don't wear clothes made out of two different materials and rules like don't eat crawfish. Obscure rule after obscure rule and yet when David reads that he understands the heart of God in heaven for him and he is enamored. Most of us can't get excited about worshiping our risen Savior once a week. Most of us, it's a chore to get up on Sunday to corporately worship our Savior. That's a little embarrassing. David's ready to sing praises to don't eat crawfish and we can't be excited and engaged in the worship of Jesus. 
When I read Psalm 119, I'm not only uh, blown away by David's love of the law, I'm also a little embarrassed about my laxity when it comes to my own worship. Johnny mentioned it, and we'll talk a lot about this this semester. Johnny and I both have a very high view of corporate worship, that is, gathering together to worship. My fear is that many Sundays and maybe even many Thursdays, corporate worship is not actually what's happening in this room. But instead, it's a lot of individuals worshiping individually, surrounded by a bunch of other individuals worshiping individually. I'm very rarely struck by how my worship or lack thereof affects those around me. I'm very uh, uh, rarely affected by whether my presence or absence in the room affects the worship that goes up that day. And this is not an arrogant uh, um, high view of how good I worship. That's not it at all. It's that even from the beginning in creation, God says he made light and it was good and he made darkness and it was good. He made land and it was good and water and it was good and birds and they were good and land animals, they were good. But it was not good that man should be alone. From the very beginning, we were designed to operate within a community, and our worship is not exempt from that. We are designed to worship corporately. And yet many of us, myself included, never once pause to think about how my worship might affect those around me. And I'm not talking about uh, being overly emotionally expressive if that's not the way that you're led to be. I'm not talking about putting on a show around for the folks around you so they think you're holier than they are. Genuine was my college worship service and we had a guy in there um, and uh, I remember Nathan was his name and uh, he loved to sing in the rests. Like when everybody else stopped singing and it was just music, he would just make noises. And I still am convinced, because I didn't really like the guy, uh, that it was just so that we would all see how holy he was and be moved by the Spirit and make these noises. I've never been an overly emotionally expressive person. I haven't been. And so I'm not asking you to do something that's wholly unnatural to you. I'm just simply asking you to reflect deeply before you even enter the sanctuary on the privilege that it is that we get to gather together, sing as loudly as we want, use powered instruments, turn the lights on with no ramifications about those that are around us. And how many of our Christians, brothers and sisters around the world desperately long for that type of freedom to get to worship corporately who maybe have never experienced what it is to get to gather with other believers because they're the only ones that they know. And we take it for granted week in and week out. I'd encourage you to read Hebrews. It will probably take you a couple hours. But I promise you there's not a better use of your time I know uh, Trey Kennedy's video, I love that. It's very very spot on. I I was very anti-TikTok at the beginning of quarantine. I'm very not so much anti-TikTok now. And I spend ample amount of time, and I'm gonna guess you're not the exception to the rule, and you do too. I would encourage you to take some of that time that you waste on other things. You're not as busy as you think you are, I promise. One day you'll actually be busy because you have kids, and you'll be a little embarrassed that you used to think you were busy. But take some of that time and just read through Hebrews all at once. Big chunk. Sit down with your roommates around the table and just go around. The case that he's making for how grand Jesus is, is incredible. And I think you'll be able to echo him if you you really took the time to engage with this text. that you too would echo him and go, my only response is worship. Some of us, that worship may be in silence, like Job was, 
when God finally brought the hammer down? He was whining, 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 and God said, okay, put your big boy pants on. He actually says, gird up your loin. Gird up your loin. I'm tired of hearing it. I'm the creator of all things seen and unseen. I'm in charge here. And Job responds with silence. It might respond with actual musical worship, singing praises. You might respond like Peter did in Acts. After he's been taken by the Sanhedrin, he's been put on trial, and they say, hey, when you leave here, I don't want you to talk about Jesus anymore. And he says, well, whether to obey you or whether to obey God, uh, which one of those is right, you can decide for yourself. But for me, I cannot but talk about the things that I've seen and heard. The same conversation that afterwards the Sanhedrin would say, uh, we can tell that they're uneducated men, but we can also tell that they've been with Jesus. I don't know what your worshipful response is. We've robbed a a great deal of what worship is by by, um, pairing it up solely with music. I don't know what sort of response you'll have, but I trust when you come face to face with the greatness of our Savior, and I promise Jesus is better than you could ever imagine. When you come to face, uh, 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 come to terms and come face to face with who Jesus is, I honestly believe you'll be able to echo the author here that there's just no other response available. And when we enter this room, if we took seriously what it, what it is that we're coming to do, to worship together Sunday morning with hundreds of other people, all proclaiming this same name of Jesus, this same great God who came on earth, the same great God that died and rose again to conquer sin and death once and for all, that we're coming together to worship that name, I suspect your experience on Sunday morning will be dramatically different. I suspect uh, we will no longer joke, Johnny and I, about uh, we got a little bit of the 930 in this worship service. Our 930 worship service, if you're an excited worshiper, come at 930, please, we need you. It gets real sad in there sometimes. I promise you, it wouldn't take more than a handful of you to really take seriously what it is that we're doing to dramatically alter the atmosphere of this room when we gather to worship. If you've ever gotten back from youth camp or finished up your disciple now or maybe you went to passion and you come back and you go, I just wish I could have that kind of worship every week. I got, a, I got a, a, a special treat for you tonight. You can, because the same Savior you worship there, you can worship here. Here's what I think the big difference is. When we go to youth camp, we go to D-Now, we go to Passion, we're anticipating God moving in a mighty way in worship, and so we worship with that anticipation. When we gather on Sunday mornings, for most of us, Maybe you're the exception, but for most of us, for us normal folks, when we gather on Sunday morning, most weeks, it's, we're checking that box. It's what we do at 11. If we came into this room with this understanding that whatever it is that you've ranked higher than Jesus, that he's better than, with this understanding that Jesus is all that he said he was, And we responded with this continual sacrifice of praise. And it is a sacrifice. Don't don't miss that. And we uh, responded with this continual sacrifice of praise. It would be a dramatically different experience for everyone in this room. And the reason we need this so badly is because there are going to be weeks that you're just not in it. 
There are going to be weeks that life has just beat you down. That life has just taken a turn for the worse. And you desperately need to see people worshiping God in a way that recognizes how great he is so that you can receive encouragement from that testimony. By the way, this is totally unrelated to all this, but I think we're really bad at sharing testimony. So I'm going to tell you, uh, last week I told you about my dad. Uh, he has cancer. I talk about it a lot. Uh, this past, this Monday, Tuesday, I don't know when it was, uh, he got the report that his incurable cancer is nowhere to be found, and my dad no longer has cancer, which is pretty incredible. Um, but there are weeks that you need the encouragement of someone who's watched God answer prayers that have been prayed for the past three years. And there were seasons in that. My, my dad needed the encouragement from you guys when, when he was uh, going to church week in and week out with a prayer that hadn't been answered for years. Corporate worship matters. Your worship affects me and my worship affects you. We were never intended to worship in our own little silo. Guys, I, I promise you, even after you read Hebrews, Jesus is still better than you could ever imagine. In the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of fear, in the midst of trepidation, in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of depression, Jesus is still better than you can imagine. And there is only, according to Scripture, one appropriate response to that truth. And it's the continual sacrifice of praise from the lips of those who claim Him. Let's pray. God, you're good and you're for our good. We're so grateful for that truth. Forgive us when we take it for granted. God, when we leave this place tonight and we head back to campus, to our apartments, to our jobs, God, I pray that you would do something so big through these people that we can't explain it by any other means than God did that. Amen. In our response to this word, let's worship through song with our voices. Let's respond.
you got. 